if we look at the history of Netanyahu, um, we've been heading to this point of the final solution, the final ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the final um, dispossession of Palestinian territory from Palestinians in order to create um, what is effectively in opposition to the Belt and Road Initiative, um, to any Russia, China, Iran, regional, global south led initiatives in the region that would uncouple them from US supremacy. Um, and Gaza is effectively instrumental to that project. It always has been. Hello, everyone. This is the New Rules Podcast, and I'm your host, Dimitri Symes, Jr. Today's episode is about tragedy and turmoil. We're talking about tragedy because of the helicopter crash that killed Iranian President Raisi and his companions. And we're talking about turmoil because of the increased pressure that Netanyahu is facing at home and abroad. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the longtime Israeli leader is genuinely facing a political crisis. To help us look at both sides of this equation, we're very pleased to welcome independent journalist Vanessa Beely. Vanessa, thank you so much for coming onto the program. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dimitri. Let me start with Iran because Raisi's death and funeral has been dominating international headlines. What What is your biggest takeaway from what we've seen over the past several days? Oh, well, I mean, I think you have to put it into context with um, everything else that is going on globally, not least of all, of course, uh, in Palestine with the ongoing Zionist uh, genocide, not only in Gaza, but also increasingly in the West Bank. Um, the attempt on the Slovak Prime Minister's life, Robert uh, Fico, a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago, uh, the unrest in Georgia, the uh, fermentation of unrest in New Caledonia, Macron is there now, and uh, French troops are uh, moving into that area. Um, China carrying out supposedly punishing uh, military exercise or naval exercises around Taiwan after the election. Um, of a so-called separatist uh, leadership uh, in Taiwan, of course, uh, enabled, I'm sure, by the United States. Um, a potential threat on the life of uh, Vucic, the leader in Serbia, um, and news of a possible coup in Turkey. So, you know, we're looking at, I, I don't really believe in coincidences at the moment. I certainly don't have any kind of smoking gun intelligence over whether this was a, a genuinely tragic incident, accident, or whether there was sabotage involved. I am seeing certain um, military experts weighing in with the idea of sabotage, and it's certainly something that I'm not going to rule out completely. Um, Azerbaijan, uh, where President Raisi and the foreign minister and various dignitaries were uh, visiting prior to the crash, of course, is effectively a client state of Israel. I think something like 70% of its weapons come from Israel, and it has been supplying oil through Turkey to Israel um, since uh, October the 7th and even from before. Um, so we're looking at a very complex geopolitical picture at the moment, and um, you know, I think for us here, I'm based in Damascus, Syria. I've been here for the last five years. Um, here, there was a tremendous sense of shock. Um, nobody expected this news. And I think while the news was coming in, people were still hoping for some kind of miracle and for the people on board to be alive. But of course, that was disproven in the early hours of the morning after the um, crash. So, um, I, I, you know, I think long term, we're not going to see, although the West would love to see that, we're not going to see any great change in direction um, from Iran, despite the loss of the president, the foreign minister, and as I said, a number of high level governors <clears throat> um, and influencers inside Iran and in the military. Um, 
And I think over the next few weeks, we're going to see the election of the new president. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing statements of reassurance from the interim government to, for example, Syria, that they will continue um, to support the resistance axis against imperialism um, in this region. And that includes also, of course, Palestine. I want to touch on the last point about continuity, mm -hmm. because I think that one of the biggest questions on people's mind is what comes next for Iran. And as you pointed out, we're living in a very turbulent time. Mm. And the Western media complex is trying to present a picture of impending doom and crisis mm -hmm. yeah. for Iran. What what do you make of that assessment? What is your uh, expectation for what happens next? Well, I think that's wishful thinking from the West. Just as we saw um, the hysteria over the Prigozhin affair, um, that this was going to be the downfall of the Putin government, um, and it was going to, uh, you know, end the dictatorship in Russia and so on. We're seeing very similar now. There was an article in the Telegraph, an opinion piece by a former U.S. ambassador whose name escapes me right now. Um, but fundamentally, it was a call uh, to arms for regime change, of course, exploiting and weaponizing the so-called uh, women's rights movement. Um, calling out Raisi as a hardline uh, president for uh, basically stamping out Western-backed terrorism in the form of the MEK that carried out multiple assassinations and attacks uh, on Iranian territory, killing, I think, during their, their spree of terrorism, more than 17,000 people, including civilians, of course. And we saw a couple of years ago the, 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 the Western attempt to ferment a kind of women's rights uh, regime change uh, movement inside Iran that frankly fell fairly flat. Um, but that's being now revived. And as I said, you know, when you look at some of these authors, um, and their affiliations to organizations that were effectively, in this case, established by former heads of Mossad, the Israeli spy agency, then that, of course, immediately raises questions about a conflict of interest. So I think w what you're going to hear from the West and what you're going to see in Iran is that there's going to be a chasm of difference between it. When you look at, I mean, he's supposedly the most hated president that Iran has ever had. But if you look at the millions that have poured onto the streets of Iran, not only in Tehran, but uh, in all the cities, in all the villages, in all the towns across Iran to basically pay their respects and to mourn um, the loss of their president and Amir Abdul Hayyan, uh, the, the foreign minister. Um, and, you know, I think where the West always underestimates its enemy is in the power of a resistance ideology. You know, I spent two weeks in Iran, basically traveling through different cities, different regions, speaking to people at the time that the West was fermenting um, this women's rights uh, movement after the death of Masa Amini, not uh, by the brutality of the security forces, but actually in a hospital. Of course, that has been completely eradicated from Western media in their haste to publish um, false information, which is not unusual. Um, when we look at um, the ideology that, that permeates throughout Iran um, of resistance, of course there is opposition um, to that ideology, as there would be in any major country. In Russia, there is opposition to the SMO. There is opposition to Putin. This is normal. Uh, situation in any country. Um, but generally, the understanding in Iran of what the resistance means, the understanding in Iran in the leadership of what the resistance means, um, the importance of the pivot towards China and Russia um, and towards BRICS uh, away from uh, Western influence, Western hegemony, uh, the support for their allies in the region, I will not call them Iranian proxies as the West would like to portray them, um, for example, <clears throat> Yemen, um, Iraq, particularly, of course, the um, PMU, the Popular Mobilization Forces, 
which are an official arm of the Iraqi military. They're not, um, you know, a disparate uh, separatist group. Um, and uh, in Syria, of course, Iran has been pivotal alongside Russia in um, preventing a regime change, a toppling of the Syrian government that has been ongoing since 2012, and then the support for Hezbollah, um, and ultimately for Palestine. Um, I don't see why any of these policies would change. Perhaps the direction would change, perhaps the speed of reaction would change, but the actual uh, fundamental policies, in my opinion, are not going to change. I think your point about Iran's Islamic ideology still re retaining wide popularity and legitimacy is really interesting and important. I hope our viewers pay attention to that. The other thing that seems to me to be a reason why regime change is unlikely in Iran or mm -hmm. another revolution is unlikely in Iran is simply that Iran seems to be heading on the right track of history. And as you pointed out, it's drawing closer to Russia and China. It's improving relations with other countries in the region. It seems like over the past few years, the Western effort to make Iran into a pariah state seems to be coming apart, that Iran seems to be finding its own place in the world. And it's starting slowly but surely to thrive. Yes, absolutely. Um, and actually, you can take that back to, to really a pivotal turning point was Iran's retaliation against Israel. Um, you know, in early April, um, I think it was the first of, second of April, because I was obviously here in Damascus when Israel bombed um, the consulate part of the embassy, Iranian embassy complex. Um, now, Iran gave, I think it was 10 days warning uh, to the West and to Israel of a retaliation. So they had time to prepare their air defenses for the US to move its aircraft carriers into the region um, in preparation uh, for Jordan to prepare its air defenses for the UK, etc. to be. So in other words, they had 10 days warning of this attack. And yet, um, the, in, the, the sort of uh, intelligence, and I'm not talking about the organization intelligence, I'm talking about the, the intellectual intelligence behind the attack, which ultimately didn't kill any civilians at all and targeted only military um, and strategic uh, installations inside the occupied territories, or Israel as, as people will probably know it. Um, unlike Israel, that Every time it has carried out a so-called assassination, a, a preemptive self-defense assassination of Iranian military or Hezbollah military here in Syria, there have always been uh, civilian uh, casualties and civilian infrastructure damage. Um, so th there were many points about this attack that I think elevated Iran to a position of one, um, a moral um, actor in, you know, on the geopolitical stage, but also it demonstrated itself no longer afraid to retaliate directly because the West had always portrayed it as retaliating or reacting through its proxies. Again, I'll use that term, but it's a Western term. Uh, Iran would say its allies. Um, and this was the first time, really, that there had been a direct attack on uh, Israeli territory and on Israeli military. And the fact that a number of missiles evaded the, the absolute firewall of US, UK, Jordanian, um, even Egyptian um, and Israeli air defenses, that sent a very strong message um, to the West and to Israel that Iran is no longer afraid to engage directly on a military um, basis. And as you said, the, you know, the, the partnerships that it has been forming with what were effectively previously enemy states like Saudi Arabia, that has brought some relief and respite to the, the civilians in Yemen, for example. Um, Yemen has benefited in, in another way through the improvement of its missile systems and its ability to actually um, act against the genocide in Palestine and to interrupt um, international shipping in the Red Sea if that international shipping 
um, is in collusion with a genocidal state, which is Israel. Meanwhile, of course, Russia and China um, can pass the sea unimpeded. Um, so I think, you know, what we're seeing is, is really a very uh, dramatic reshuffling of the geopolitical cards with, as you said, Iran coming um, very close to the top and very much on the right side of history and in alliance with the rising power um, in the East. So I think the conclusion that our viewers can walk away with when it comes to Iran is that although it has suffered a very significant loss with the death of Raisi, with the death of his minister and the others involved in the crash. Overall, the country still has a very bright future ahead of it. The same cannot be said for Israel, for whom the situation seems to be getting worse and worse. And particularly for Netanyahu, it seems to be getting worse and worse. You have the ICC issuing an arrest warrant for him, despite months of U.S. pressure efforts. You have members of his war cabinet publicly slam his post-war Gaza plan and threaten to resign. And you have growing protest against Netanyahu in major cities across Israel. In your view, how precarious is Netanyahu's current situation right now? I have a slightly different take on it because um, how the Zionists run their PR and their propaganda is very much to establish what appears to be uh, from the outside an opposition to, let's say, the more extremist policymakers. Now, they don't only do this in Israel. I think now it's becoming prevalent in Israel, but they've been doing that for years in the West. Um, so they'll create an organization that will apparently stand in opposition to Zionist policies. But in reality, of course, uh, where you'll have an extremist policy advocate on one side, and then you'll have this this cosmetic opposition, which eventually brings them to a middle ground, which is what they were looking for anyway. That This is just my opinion. So while you're saying there is internal um, division, I would have agreed with you a couple of weeks ago. Now I'm not quite so sure because I'm starting to see this pattern reemerge. Because you have Netanyahu, who's basically always going to be uh, at the higher level of extremism and fascism, basically, um, in his policies towards uh, Palestine, which, by the way, are no different to those of, for example, Ariel Sharon. We can we can talk about that because what we're now seeing is the revisiting of Ariel Sharon's policies, particularly um, in Gaza, but also in the West Bank. Um, and then you'll have Yoav uh, Gallant, or as you mentioned, Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz, I'm probably not going to comment on because I haven't been following quite as closely. But if you look at what Yoav Gallant is actually recommending, and he's putting it forward as a challenge to what Netanyahu is recommending, in reality, it's it's that kind of good cop, bad cop routine again, because what Yoav Gallant is recommending is effectively kind of the same as Netanyahu. Right. He's, he doesn't want um, Israeli authority in Gaza. He wants Palestinian authority, but it has to be the right kind of Palestinian authority. In other words, it has to be a Palestinian authority that is fully normalized with Israel, that is going to reject radicalization or any kind of resistance ideology. It's not so far away um, from Netanyahu's dystopian vision of 2035 in Gaza. Right. So I, I think what we've got here is this um, seeming objection to Netanyahu's policy while heading for, for what is a, a more acceptable middle ground uh, as an end game. I could be wrong, but that's how I'm reading it right now. So, Ven, are these public disagreements just political theater or is are they sort of meant to cover up an internal battle for power, right? Where let's say Gallant is uh, opposing Netanyahu, not because he has a substantive philosophical disagreement, but because he yeah. thinks he would be a better prime minister of Israel than Netanyahu. And he sees yeah. an opportunity to try and force Netanyahu off the throne. Yeah, um, I think that that is much closer to the, to the truth. And I actually wrote that fairly recently in the last few days. Um, you know, the U.S. sees the, the, the U.S. has to some degree got issues with Netanyahu because he's destroying their optics, basically. 
um, of uh, their protectionism and apologism for uh, Zionist fanaticism and ethno supremacism. Um, Yav Gallant presents a slightly better optic. He comes across as more pragmatic, um, more um, conciliatory to some degree, as I said, to a very small degree, in, in my opinion. Let's not forget it was him that was saying they should starve them and deprive them of electricity and water and et cetera. All right. So there could be some coaching going on also from the US side um, to present Yoav Gallant as an alternative uh, to Netanyahu, although I think the chances of Netanyahu abandoning his position are low because of uh, the repercussions that he's going to face of being prosecuted for corruption, etc. And, you know, we shouldn't forget that Netanyahu, um, back in 1997, um, was prime minister uh, when he commissioned basically from uh, U.S. officials uh, the Clean Break Doctrine, which effectively advocated for uh, integration by Israel with uh, Arab states, which is now what we're seeing since uh, Trump, the Trump administration in 2020 introduced the Abraham Accords, which immediately brought on board the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco with Saudi Arabia, of course, waiting in the wings, negotiating with the US, supposedly digging in their heels over um, a Palestinian state, although what is left of Palestinian territory with which to create a Palestinian state is a question that should be asked. Um, and so, um, you know, if we look at the history of Netanyahu, um, We've been heading to this point of the final solution, the final ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the final um, dispossession of Palestinian territory from Palestinians in order to create um, what is effectively in opposition to the Belt and Road Initiative, um, to any Russia, China, Iran, regional, global south led initiatives in the region that would uncouple them from U.S. supremacy. Um, and Gaza is effectively instrumental to that project. It always has been. I mean, look at the 100 plus, oh, sorry, 1 trillion um, cubic feet of gas off the coast of, of Palestine. And then in, in the Levant Basin in itself, something like 122 trillion cubic feet of gas. Um, which is essential to the project which Netanyahu presented at the UNGA before October the 7th, which is the Indian Middle East European Corridor, which cuts through basically all of the normalized uh, Gulf states into Israel and uses Gaza as uh, gas production for industrial produce in Gaza itself and creates this free trade zone um, between uh, the occupied territories, Gaza and al in Egypt. So, you know, I think while ostensibly there is opposition to Netanyahu, I don't think we can ignore the fact that Netanyahu is a very practiced player uh, in, in these sort of geopolitical chess games and that he's been there from the beginning to push this project through. You make a really interesting point because, you know, the Biden administration makes this whole theatrical performance of how they're deeply concerned about what Netanyahu is doing in Gaza and mm -hmm. how they would really like to see the Israelis take more restrained measures, right? Uh, but I think you note that even if Biden has some sincere apprehensions about what Israel and Netanyahu is doing. They geopolitically need Netanyahu and Israel to keep doing what they're doing in order mm. to maintain U.S. hegemony in the Middle East. Absolutely. And I mean, not only Biden. If you look, um, I keep citing this statement because it was so extraordinary. Um, Robert F. Kennedy uh, Jr. made a statement in an interview, um, I think, late last year. And in that statement, he basically pointed out the importance of Israel to the United States. I mean, he, you know, rolled out the usual national security tropes. Um, but it's basically to ward off the rise of Russia and China, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, and of these countries taking control of the commodities in the region. 
Um, he made that extremely clear. I mean, apart from the fact that he pointed out that Israel is their military outpost in the region, that it provides intelligence for them, that it provides interference into the internal affairs of states in the region, which, of course, um, we saw definitely firsthand here in Syria because Israel is supporting effectively the terrorist groups that have tried to destabilize Syria, which include um, ISIS and al-Qaeda and various offshoots and the Kurdish separatists in the northeast and is currently fomenting a separatist movement in the south, um, which has always been um, on, the, on the plans of expansion um, for Israel. And again, going back to Netanyahu, Netanyahu's uh, roots are in the Yabotinsky uh, strain of Zionism, which is an expansionist Zionism, which has as its trajectory um, Greater Israel. And I would even argue that Greater Israel, you can almost say that it is being achieved um, through the normalization of the Abraham Accords. Because if you look at the map of Greater Israel, it takes in the territories of Jordan. Well, Jordan was involved in the defense of Israel um, against the Iranian uh, retaliatory attack. Jordan, you know, has has really quietly and tacitly been supporting um, Israel since October the 7th and before. Um, but you look at the appropriation of uh, Saudi partnership, investment, um, industry, again, through through the possibility of normalization. Bahrain, UAE, Egypt is on board with Israel, um, particularly with regards to the IMEC project. Um, and has been enabling the genocide in Gaza through the blockade, um, through profiteering um, on, of, sorry, from Palestinians that were leaving um, for uh, hospitalization or just as refugees from the terror of life in Gaza since October the 7th. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think to to really pay any attention to the US claims that they're trying to damp down the genocide is for me kind of delusional. Um, at the end of the day, they're supplying the bombs that are literally slaughtering. Um, I, I think even the number of 35,000 is way too low um, when you consider the bodies that are probably still under rubble. And then look at the fact that Biden has built the so-called humanitarian uh, pier, which, by the way, um, interlocks with the Netzarim corridor, which has been re-established uh, by the Israeli forces to connect um, uh, east to west uh, Gaza, ending at the pier. And as the pier has been seen on satellite images, actually facilitating weapons and equipment being supplied to the Israeli army at the coastal uh, checkpoint. And the Netzarim corridor which has been re-established fully by the Israeli forces. That brings us back to Ariel Sharon prior to the withdrawal from uh, Gaza, which again was a cosmetic political move by Ariel Sharon, um, where he had uh, the project of partitioning Gaza with the Netzarim corridor, dividing north from south. Um, and under Netanyahu's kind of dystopian plan for Gaza, the Netzarim Corridor will again be instrumental in dividing north from south. North will be seen as the industrial sector in the kind of hideous Dubai type vision that Netanyahu has. And that will combine industry inside northern Gaza um, with the uh, southern occupied territories. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing, in my opinion, is the coming together of this plan. Um, and as I've always said, you know, people talk about the greater Israel plan. They talk about less so, but the clean break doctrine. But plans change and they develop. And if I look at it now, Israel is pretty far down the road in actually achieving uh, what it wanted to achieve with the clean break doctrine. So clearly Netanyahu has these sort of really ambitious plans when it comes to Gaza in terms of occupying it, as you said, it, making it into sort of his own version of Dubai, his sort of economic crown jewel that he can exploit. Mm -hmm. But is that really feasible, given what we've seen happen on the battlefield where Israeli soldiers are struggling 
to pacify a small strip of land in places where they supposedly cleared out Hamas. We see Hamas fighters reappear, uh, start, you know, anger, organizing ambushes, other attacks. We see Israel struggle to contain the situation on its northern border. It really seems like Netanyahu is biting off more than he can chew. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, um, military experts far more experienced than I am I ha have uh, also stated that Israel is effectively losing the ground war in Gaza. And, and I would say, of course, that is true. It's also um, really losing the war in, in the northern occupied territories where it's engaging with Hezbollah at the border. Um, you know, there are, I don't know, I think around 200,000 refugees from that area, businesses shut down. And it appears that, you know, those settlers from that area are not going to be able to return there anytime soon or basically being put up in hotels across the rest of the occupied territories where there are reports of them not being treated particularly well. Um, and, you know, from from a ground war perspective, no, Israel is losing the war. But from another perspective, from a from a pure human perspective, you know, civilians inside Gaza, 1.5 million civilians have been pushed pillar to post. They were told to go from the north to the south because of now the south was safe, then they were told to basically um, one million people took refuge in Rafa in the, in the southern uh, part of the Gaza Strip on close to the border with Egypt. Um, now they've been told to displace from there to go back to the areas that have been the worst uh, destroyed uh, by the Israeli forces, like, for example, Khan Yunus, where there is now no electricity and no water, where everything is reduced to rubble. And, and at, concurrently, Israel is now basically flattening uh, Rafa. You know, Gaza is without um, agriculture, without electricity, without water, without food, without humanitarian resources, hospitals, schools, universities. They've destroyed uh, records and archives. And that asks, you know, when I think ahead, that, that asks the question, how will these Palestinians, if, for example, the Gazan territory does come under some kind of uh, Zionist influenced authority, whether it is Palestinian or whether it's Arab state, um, how will these Palestinians actually prove that this property or this land was theirs if all the archives and records have been destroyed? You know, um, and so, yes, of course, the Palestinian resistance is, is fighting. I think it's fair to say both sides are fighting an existential war. Yoav Gallant, before Christmas 2023, he actually said, we have to have a victory in order to survive in the Middle East, in the Middle East. Um, and for the Palestinian resistance, this is kind of, um, you know, the, the hill they're going to die on um, over the establishment of a Palestinian state and, and liberation from Zionist oppression. Um, and for the resistance access, Palestinian liberation is their reason to be. Uh, so for Hezbollah, for um, the Islamic resistance in Iraq, for Syria, which of course is fighting on multiple fronts within its own territory even now, although the, the hot war has cooled down, um, Syria is still surrounded on pretty much all sides by hostile occupation forces whether it's Al-Qaeda in the northwest, Turkey in the north, U.S. in the northeast with the Kurdish countries, and then coming down the eastern flank to the south where Israel is fomenting um, a separatist movement with Druze factions that are in favor um, of uh, uh, federalism in, in the south. Um, <clears throat> and for Iran and for Yemen, um, you know, so... Of course, you know, as I said in a recent article, the best laid plans of mice and men can get dashed on, on the rocks of what is an ideological resistance against what Zionism is, which is a form of ethno supremacism. It has links to Nazism. Many of the Zionist leaders, of course, originated in Ukraine. Um, and most of them came from outside the region. <clears throat> I'm talking about the the um, leadership now. Um, 
and so yes, we we are at um, a point, a, a real tipping point, not only for Palestine but for the region, and so therefore, I, I think what you're now seeing is an is um, a, a, an exercise in incentivization. So when you look at Netanyahu's plan, it's all about incentivization, having absolutely uh, bombed and decimated and terrified the population of Gaza for what is it, seven months now? The incentivization is just give up the resistance ideology, just give up Hamas, and we'll allow you to live in safe areas inside Gaza while we build all this industry around you, while we exploit your resources that we've not allowed you um, to have any access to since they were discovered. Um, but don't worry about that. We'll allow you to work as slave labor in the industry that we're going to develop. You know, the thing is, again, for me, just as they underestimate the strength of an ideology, whether it is in Russia or in China or in Iran, they're underestimating the strength of the Palestinian resistance, not only in the resistance forces and in the military, which isn't only Hamas, there's more than 17 resistance factions um, inside Gaza that are not only Islamic either. You have the PFLP, you have, you know, you have Christian um, um, resistance to Zionism, you have Jewish resistance to Zionism, you have atheist resistance to Zionism, um, not only in Palestine, but globally. Um, so I think in, you know, in answer to your question, I really hope that the dystopian vision for Gaza doesn't come to fruition because it would be the end of one of the most important, uh, cultures in this region, one of the most important heritage, um, entities. I mean, it, it would just be horrifying. So I think, you know, we have to have faith in the resistance. We have to have faith in also um, the morality of humanity, which of course we're seeing um, in the protests that are sweeping the US, the EU and the UK, um, protests against what the Zionists are doing with the backing of the US, the UK leadership and the EU leadership in Palestine. And on that powerful note, thank you so much for coming on today. No, thank you so much for having me on. You just watched the New Rules podcast. I'm your host, Dimitri Symes Jr., and our guest today was Vanessa Bealey. If you like this video, please make sure to like it, to repost it, and to follow us on Rumble and on X. Also, if you like our content, please make sure to send it to your friends and family. It really helps get the message out there. Thank you all for tuning in. Till next time.